I, uh, um, that video gets me every time. Um, and just what a cool day it was. But I, I had a, an experience just buying donuts the other day, um, which is a pretty common experience for me. But <laughs> I, I was wearing um, the Church Has Left the Building t-shirt, and the lady behind the counter said something. To, she's like, what does that mean? The Church Has Left the Building. So I told her about the event, but I said, it's really, it's about much more than that. It's about every time we leave this building, we want, we want the church to go with us. We want people in our neighborhood. So she's like, so you want it to be like a, like a real thing, like people see you. And I was like, that's exactly right. She's like, I think I get it. Like I, um, but it was a really cool conversation. Um, I want to begin this morning by just asking you a question. Who, who in your life do you most closely resemble? And, and by that, I mean maybe less like physically, but, but more so in your personality and your practice. So who is it that, that people say to you all the time, oh, that reminds me so much of so-and-so. Um, that reminds me, oh, that sounded so much like whatever. Like, I always grew up hearing that about my dad, that I that was being compared to my dad. So our, our sort of dry sense of humor that we both thought was hilarious, but everybody else thought was mildly annoying, or um, our extroverted habits of talking to just complete and total strangers and striking up conversations and in weird places, and our inability to be able to read a circumstance and be able to determine that maybe now's not the time to inject our dry sense of humor um, is something that we both shared and that our wives have appreciated about us over the years. Um, and, and it's true that, yes, some of that is biological. Some of it is, is the result of the fact that I share DNA with my dad. But a lot of it, especially as it as it relates to some of those personality things and those, those character things are the result that I, of me spending so much time with him and around him and in his presence during my formative years. Spent time watching him and learning from him and just, just being around him. In fact, I, I brought a picture this morning. This is me, I'm not sure how old I am, but I'm just watching my dad shave, you know, learning. Okay, let's see how that's done there. Like, taking it all in with our awesome wallpaper and my dad's cool robe, like, um, just, just standing there. I love this picture because it always sort of captured a little bit of the relationship between him and I and, and how I viewed him and the presence that he was in my life and because I wanted to be like him. Like, I, he taught me how to change the oil in a car and, and how to fix things in the house and, and how to treat um, how he treated his wife and what that looked like for me growing up and respecting and treating women and, and how you did all of these things that are so key to, to life. I wanted to become like him because I admired him and looked up to him because, because I spent time in his presence. And we do this in other areas of life, right? We find people in whether it's the workforce or in a particular uh, area that we want to grow in or sometimes even in in hobbies, they're really good at, at a particular thing, and so we, we ask to be around them and to watch them and see if we can learn from them because we're essentially saying to them, teach me to be like you. I, I want to be more like you, and so show me what it is that, that you do. Today we're beginning a series, as I mentioned, entitled With Jesus that will take us through, through the fall here, and we're going to explore what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus. What, what does it look like for us to identify as followers of Jesus? What does it look like for us as the church to say to him, we want to be, what do we want to be more like you? And how do we do that? There's a passage in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, where um, Jesus is, is recruiting and calling some of his first disciples. Just hear this. This is uh, John 1, verse 35. It says, the next day John, it's, it's referring to John the Baptist here, was again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. And so they went and saw where he was staying and spent the day with him, and it was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard John, uh, heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah that is the Christ. 
and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated to Peter. So there's that small little, and maybe, maybe you even missed it, in verse 39, where he says that when they're following him, that they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon, which is not just like a throw-off comment. They're basically saying, like, we, we spent the whole day with Jesus. And oftentimes, this is my idea of, of what it means to be a disciple or a follower, what it means to be with Jesus. This is the picture that I want to conjure up, is that you're just kind of in his presence. You're, you're almost like in... In, in relational terms, like you're just, you're hanging out with him, you're, you're around him, you're watching him do what he does, and you're learning from him, picking up, it, it maybe is almost like this somewhat relaxed, like he's just doing life, and you get to be there to experience it, and I, I think that's true. When we read the Gospels, we see examples of this time and time again. Jesus invites us in, but what I've discovered is that I can oftentimes operate out of a, a limited or a partial understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Perhaps you can relate to this as well. I sometimes catch myself thinking of Jesus as, as like my life coach, someone who is really good at giving advice, who will ultimately help me improve in, in all of these key areas of my life so I can be a better husband and I can be a better father and, and I can be a better pastor. And, and that's not untrue. It's not as if Jesus doesn't speak into these areas of our life. However, when, when I sort of limit it to that, when, when I sort of make it that's all that it is, it's, it's just incomplete. Or I find myself from time to time thinking of Jesus as, and what it means to be with Jesus as a really good friend. That, that he's somebody who's always there for me. Um, someone that I can count on. Someone who can lend a helping hand. And once again, there's absolute truth in that. He is there for us. But following Jesus is it's more than just gaining a new best friend. Sky Jatani wrote a book um, entitled With, Reimagining the Way You Relate to God. And at the outset of that book, he describes four ways that we view our relationship with God that, that are in best in, uh, incomplete. They're, they're partial views. One, he talks about life under God, where your understanding of the relationship is if I follow all the rules, and, and I'm, if my life is, is sacrificial enough, then God is going to bless me, and, 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 and I'll earn his favor sort of idea. Which this is a Sicily, the system that religion is built on. If you take religion away from relationship, that's, that's what we're communicating. Hey, do enough good stuff, church. God will shower some blessings on you, and if you're not receiving those, you're probably not doing enough good stuff. Um, it's not that that's completely void of truth. God does call us to obedience and things like that, but that's, that's not the relationship that he calls us to. Then he talks about life over God. This is, this is sort of the idea that, that maybe God is out there, maybe he's quasi-involved in what's going on in our lives, but ultimately, I'm the one in control. I sort of make my own destiny. So I can relegate God to this, this old idea from a bygone era, and, and, and we're all sort of too sophisticated for this in the here and now. And so God is a nice idea that we pull on maybe if we're in trouble, or things are difficult, or it's Christmas, but, but the rest of the year, he's sort of kind of in the back seat, just hovering around doing whatever. Again, commonplace um, in our culture. Then he talks about life from God, and and this really is an interesting one because this is our tendency to shape our understanding of God in our own image. Um, there's actually been uh, research done on students in Christian colleges and, and, and professors have asked the question like, who, how do you understand Jesus? What is he like? What, and, and what's interesting is a lot of the feedback that they get resembles how they understand themselves. That there's a correlation between how they view and see themselves and and what they think Jesus must have been like. Um, and so this is the God of our own making. He's a lot like me, and he exists to supply what I desire or need. So this, this view of, of understanding God, when this is taken to its nth degree, this just becomes the prosperity gospel. That God is this cosmic Santa Claus, and he's there just to, to pour out his, his favor on us. 
we value God for what he can do for us rather than valuing God himself. And then lastly, Jatani talks about life for God. And this is, this is uh, a lot like um, life under God, but life for God is all about what we do. It's, it's sort of our efforts to kind of earn spiritual merit badges so we find that God will find us acceptable. And it becomes all about being on mission and, and accomplishing some grand spiritual goal. But it actually ends up making the idol out of the mission rather than the God that it serves. So Jutani goes on to describe how all of these views and, and relating to God ultimately contain some elements of truth, but they fall short of the heart of God. Simply that God desires his sons and daughters to be with him. It's a relationship, and the simplicity of it almost makes it difficult for us to understand or believe. So the call then to follow Jesus, the call to be with him, is a call to live our lives with Jesus. Let me say that again. The call to follow Jesus is a call to live our lives with Jesus. It's, it's all-encompassing. It requires sacrifice and surrender. Following Jesus isn't about um, feeling fear when we're, when we're afraid we've screwed up. It's not about a dutiful obligation and an attempt to, to win his approval. And it's not about um, getting him to kind of bless whatever it is that we're doing and to serve our agendas. The call to follow Jesus is a call to live our lives, all of our lives, with him. And this is what we want to explore and to wrestle with over the next several weeks together. See, because when Jesus ultimately gets to a place where he describes what it means to follow him, he doesn't, he doesn't describe for us a life coach or, or a really good friend. Um, he actually talks about counting the cost and in order to understand what it means to be with him. We're going to turn now to Luke chapter 14. And you're going to see a really stark contrast between what we saw in John chapter 1, where the disciples are just with him and they're doing life, and, and now Jesus is in a different place in his ministry. And, and this is, um, these are difficult words that Jesus says. This is Luke 14, beginning in 20, uh, verse 25. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if they have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying the person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation whether the other, while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. So there, there, there's no getting around the fact that those words in Luke chapter 15 are, or chapter 14 are, are difficult. Um, and how does this square with this God who his desire is for us to be with us, to live our lives with Jesus, with this standard that, that Jesus has just described? So as we work our way through these verses, I want to look at two things primarily this morning. I want to look at the nature of the call, and then I want to look at the promise um, to be with us, the call and the promise. So let's look at the call to be with Jesus, the call to be with Jesus. I, when I read this passage, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, or you've seen these, but oftentimes on TV, you'll see these commercials for medications, right? And it, and, and it always starts so promising. It's always like this, like it's the sun is setting and people are walking on a beach and whatever issue or ailment that this resolves, like this is going to take it away and, and you're going to be happy. And then about the time that you're sort of like no longer paying attention to the commercial, they sort of like tag on at the end of this, by the way, like there's all these side effects. 
and your hair could fall out and you're probably gonna lose a few toes and blind in one eye and possible death. Like it always ends with possible death, like for some, some reason. You're like, that's a lot, like that's a lot to take on for like thicker eyelashes or whatever the, this medication is supposed to do for us, right? Like it, that's a lot of, and it, it feels like that when, when I read this passage. When I hear this, it's like the idea of being with Jesus sounds, that, 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 like, sign me up. Like when I read John 1, I'm like, how cool would that be just to be able to be in his presence and to watch what he does? And then when Jesus gets to this point in Luke 14 and he's describing this, you're kind of like, wait, what? Like, that, it feels so um, heavy and dramatic. We have to look at this, these words of Jesus here, in light of, of the context that is surrounding him. And Luke's overall narrative in, in his gospel. If you go all the way back in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is just beginning his ministry. And Luke describes how as Jesus is, is beginning to spread his word around, people become, they hear about it and they are attracted to it. In Luke 4 verse 37, it says, Reports of, about him went out into every place and the surrounding regions. So Jesus is, is now drawing a crowd. People are listening to him talk about the kingdom of God. They're watching him cure people of leprosy and, and restore sight to the blind. They, they've seen him raise people from the dead. People are coming from everywhere just, just to listen to and to watch Jesus. But Jesus understands what's in front of him now. And later on in Luke, in chapter 9, it says that Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Th this is the journey that Jesus is on now. He knows that he's on his way to Jerusalem where he is, is going to be unjustly accused. He will suffer a, a mock trial and he will ultimately be crucified. And that the crowds that have gathered around to watch him perform miracles and to teach parables, the, these people are going to scatter. See, this isn't, this isn't an example of Jesus being overly dramatic. It's an example of Jesus being honest with those followers about what it means to be with him on his way to Jerusalem. See, I, I, I like to talk about and preach about, we like to hear about when Jesus is teaching us on grace and, and on loving our neighbor and on forgiveness, but this, not so much. I don't like to talk about these things. The words of Jesus here are, are difficult and they're uncomfortable and they're challenging. And that's exactly what Jesus intends. If, if you were Jesus' PR guy, if you're in charge of his brand recognition, this is not the speech that you write for him. This, this isn't going to win him any fans. And that's exactly the point that Jesus is making. Because now as Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, he wants to make a distinction between those who are around him and those who are with him. He, he's going to distinguish between those, between the crowds, the masses who've come to watch the show and what it means to be with him. And so in these verses, Jesus in no uncertain term describes the cost of being a disciple. What does it really mean? To, to walk as a follower of Jesus. We don't live in a, in a culture these days where we talk a lot about being an apprentice. That still exists some places, particularly in the trades. Like you guys know I, I, I'm a woodworker and I will follow all these woodworkers on like YouTube and stuff. And they'll oftentimes refer to the way that they cut a dovetail or the way they perform a certain trade and they say, well, I, I studied under this person. I was the apprentice of this person, and this is how they taught me to do it. And so this is the way that I do it. See, in order to be the apprentice of someone, you are bound, particularly in this culture, that they, they did everything through apprenticeship. No matter what your craft was, no matter what you were taking on, how you earned your living, you learned it by being the apprentice of someone. And in this culture, you are bound to your teacher, your mentor, and their way of doing things. So here in these verses, Jesus is describing for us this, this, what is so central in the Christian life, what, what it means to be an apprentice of Jesus. And he says, if you are going to be my apprentice, if you're going to be bound to my teaching, my way of doing things, then understand what this means for you. And again, Jesus is not, the crowd that's hearing this for the first time, this is easy for us to disconnect from. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus is not talking hypothetically here. 
if those people go with him to Jerusalem, if, they, if they're going to identify as his followers, it very likely for them is going to mean that they are ostracized from their family. That we want nothing to do with you anymore. It very well mean, could mean for them that their, their very life is at risk. He's saying, I want you to understand what this is going to require. I want you to know, as we distinguish between those who are around, and he's saying, those who are with me. I want you to know the cost of being a disciple. So he uses this emphatic, even shocking language here. Again, in verse 26 and 7, he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Two things here I just just want us to observe about what it means to be with Jesus. First, Jesus makes it a matter of of ultimate allegiance or or highest priority. Jesus is answering the question, what, what has to come first? So Jesus in these verses is not talking about emotional hatred of our family. That all throughout Scripture, we are instructed to love our parents, to love our spouse, to love our brothers and sisters, to love everyone around us. So Jesus is not talking about actual emotional hatred of our family. He's using a common cultural um, understanding or, or emphasis of describing of what is supreme devotion to you. What is of supreme devotion to you? Your ultimate allegiance. What is first priority because everything else then is 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 as if you hated those things and this is this is what jesus is describing he says unless that's me you can't be my disciple i want to take a moment just to think about this for a second because i think this is so easily and quickly misunderstood see if we were to see this in any other context if, if we were to hear anyone else say this it would be an example of the of like ultimate arrogance right or, or, on the flip side, ultimate insecurity. Um, but when Jesus says these words, when he talks about ultimate allegiance to him, this is above all else ordering or prioritizing our other loves. They find their self in, in their proper place. For example, I, I, as you know, I love my wife. She's, of all the human beings that God has ever put on this earth, she's my favorite. And you guys are close second. Like, you're right there. You're, in the, you're definitely up there. But if I were to put my love for my wife as in the place of supreme devotion, then I would actually put on there an expectation that my wife could never meet. I, I would actually ask things of her that that she could never live up to. I would, so what ends up happening when I put that relationship in a place of supreme devotion, instead of that flourishing, instead of that being healthy, it actually begins to erode. It actually begins to fall apart because I've placed an expectation on that that she can't meet. And this is what Jesus is teaching us here. He's, he's helping us order our loves. When good things become the ultimate things in our lives, they become idols and we place a burden on them that they will never live up to. So Jesus here, he gives us two quick examples that, that are, I think are, are typical in any culture, any time in history. He, he gives us the example of family or tribe. So I, this is of most importance. It's the most importance of, of being a more, or it's most importance, even we could talk about it in church identity, all sorts of things that we place our identity in. And then he talks about it in terms of self, of dying to self, things that we tend to place ultimate devotion in. And then Jesus goes on and says it's a matter of sacrifice. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. It's, again, this loses its impact on us because we don't live in a world where crucifixion is a thing. We don't live in a world where that's something that we see, but Jesus is using the metaphor in a culture where this happens of of what he's calling to us of crucifixion, of laying down our lives. And this is is bold, this is dramatic, and, and Jesus wants to be clear here. Following him means dying to ourselves. 
It, it means dying to our agendas and our plans and our desire to live according to our will and, and live under our authority. Jesus is saying, in order to follow me, in order to be my disciple, you lay it down, you sacrifice it. And it, it sounds harsh. It sounds demanding. But again, I would argue that when we rightly understand the words of Jesus here, it's, it's actually what Jesus is calling us to is incredibly loving because what he understands and that we fail to understand is that true, fulfilling, meaningful life is ultimately found in Christ. It's found in being with Jesus. This is, this is what he's calling us to and describing. He, he understands that I make a lousy God for myself. When Diedrich Bonhoeffer wrote the book, The Cost of Discipleship, he, he wrote a simple sentence, but I think is incredibly profound. He says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. So it's a, it's a matter of sacrifice, of laying down of me for something greater. So this is the call that Jesus is laying out here, but in the midst of this call, we also discover a promise. The promise to be with us. The promise that he makes, that he will be with us. Have you, I don't know if you've ever found yourself in the midst of a, a situation or some ask of your life where it's like, you know that this is beyond your ability to do. Like, you, you look at it and you say, I can't do that. That's exactly what it, what it feels like when you read these verses. Yesterday, just last evening, I had the opportunity to officiate a wedding for one of our Chapel Street uh, Church Mill Creek fans. Uh, families and and when you think about it, I was looking at the vows that these couples were saying to each other and um, not to be skeptical but I was like well you, you're not gonna do that like <laughs> right think about your own vows for a second like did you did you always cherish always honor did you always forgive did you always like that might be the intent that that might be what you say you want to do, but we don't do that perfectly. And the beauty of the vows, right, is the other person is saying, I know you're going to fail in this, and I'm vowing to stay in the midst of it. Matter of fact, we have a couple here today, this weekend, 72 years of marriage, Frank and Joe, is that right? That's, that's an excellent, when, when they told me that, his daughter told me that when they came in, he said, shh, you're making me sound old. <laughs> You know, when you think about the words that Jesus is saying here, like it's easy to feel discouraged. Um, it's easy to feel like this is, this is an impossible standard to meet, um, that, that I am disqualified, that, that I can never live up to, I don't have what it takes, and I'm absolutely right. I, I don't have what it takes. I can't do this. In fact, Jesus, I'm going to skip over it. But Jesus cites two examples. He cites the example of a builder and he cites the example of a king. And I've never noticed this before about these, these examples, but in both instances, Jesus talks about these in the negative. He says, imagine a builder who, who doesn't have the, the resources, the materials, and the money to complete the project. And imagine the king who doesn't have the, the men in order to go gain the military victory. Like, what is, why does Jesus do that in both cases in the negative. What is he saying here? See, what I think he wants us to understand is that we don't have what it takes. In our best moments, in our greatest desires, we ultimately don't have enough strength in and of ourselves to meet the standard of what it is to be with Jesus. Why, and this is why the, important, uh, the uh, emphasis on the promise is so important. Because ultimately, when we add it up, we inevitably come up short. And this is exactly the conclusion that he wants us to come to. Later on in Luke chapter 18, there's this instance where um, people are talking to Jesus, and Jesus makes the statement, he says, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the people respond somewhat exasperated. Then who can be saved? Like, if that's the standard, who can be saved? And Jesus has this great reply, he says, what's impossible with man is possible with God. See, it's, it's only when we recognize that we don't have what it takes to follow Jesus. It's, it's not in and of ourselves that we're truly ready to be his disciples. That, that's the place 
that we understand what it means to be with him because we depend on the promise that he always and consistently makes when he calls us to be with him, he promises to be with us. This is, this is what Jesus wants us to know. The call is met with a promise that he will be with us. He does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. This is the promise that Jesus affords us as he calls us to be with him. You know, one of the, um, the reminders that we have in our faith of, of this promise of Jesus, we experience in, um, at the table when we take the bread and the cup. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up, and we're going to conclude this morning by responding to God's word and responding to the worship that we've participated in by receiving communion together. Again, if you are new here with us, I want you to know that if you've placed your faith in Jesus for your salvation, you are invited to, to participate in the cup. This isn't a Chapel Street thing. This is the table of Jesus Christ. Um, and I want you, as you hold, the, the ushers will pass the plates, and you'll take both the, the cup and the bread. There's two cups stacked together. Take those and hold on to them, and I'll come back and, and guide us in communion together. But as you hold those cups, my... My desire today is that you would be reminded of the promise that the call for us to be with him is met with the promise that he is with us and that we are reminded we experience that again in the bread that is his body that's given for us in the cup that is the blood of, of our salvation. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you again for this day and this opportunity. God, we thank you for your words in Luke 14, as hard as they are to hear. Lord, thank you for understanding um, our own shortcomings, and thank you for meeting us in the midst of those shortcomings with your promise that you will be with us. So God, I pray today, as, as we come to the table, Lord, I pray that, that our hearts would come to a place of surrender and of sacrifice, that you would be our ultimate devotion, and that we would lay everything else down in pursuit of you. But Jesus, when we fall short of that, meet us there with your grace and your compassion and your forgiveness. Remind us this morning as we come to your table.